Welcome to Trending in Education. This is Mike Palmer. Really happy today to talk about umbrellas, umbrella effects, umbrella projects. I'm joined today by Dr. Jennifer Forrestal, who is the founder of the Umbrella Project. She's written a book called The Umbrella Effect. It happens to be raining here in Brooklyn, which is extremely apropos. Jennifer, welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here, Mike, and I can't wait to chat. I think we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because what you're talking about is very much related to the social emotional skills that are necessary to be resilient and adaptive and deal with the complexities of the world around us. We're going to dig into all that in a bit. Before we do that, we always like to start with your story so that people get to know you a little bit better. Can you catch us up on how you got to this point in your professional life? Sure. Yeah. So my first profession was as a naturopathic doctor. What's interesting about our profession, I think, is that we don't like the idea of, you know, carrying on with your life, waiting until something happens, until you get sick, and then trying to treat that thing. In naturopathic medicine, one of our core principles is that we really like to be proactive with well-being. So I was really lucky early in my practice to get to focus more and more on pediatric well-being, which is a huge topic right now. Yeah. And I was just seeing more and more and more kids in my practice who were struggling with their mental health and started to realize that there are some really fundamental things that we're not explicitly teaching kids about how they can get proactive about developing the skills they're going to need to cope with challenges. And, yeah. you know, the first principle in the book is there's a 100% chance of rain in your child's life and in yeah. yours. Like, nobody is getting out of this without challenges. But the education system, much like medicine, much like everything, often takes the stance of responding to the acute problems mm. instead of proactively thinking like every child in this classroom will face difficulties. Some of them will go through divorce. Some of them will get sick. Some of them will fail classes. Some of them will be bullied. But everybody is going to go through some stuff. Yeah. So how are we proactively preparing them for that? We think a lot about how we're proactively preparing them for the next level of education, you know, for right. grade three and then for grade four and five, right? But we, we don't often think in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I think that early part of my career really led me down a path to developing some proactive tools for teachers to use in classrooms to teach kids, first of all, the umbrella metaphor, which is basically just that not getting out of life without some rain, but yeah. what an umbrella does is it allows you to go outside even when it's raining. Right. So we talk about all of your coping skills that you might see in different character education programs or virtue or trait based programs. We sort of put them all together into the idea of an umbrella. They all form one of those little pieces of an umbrella. Yeah. They're all important and useful and they weave together. And if you practice them enough, you'll have a tool that's in your control, even when the world around you doesn't feel like it's in your control. Yeah. And I really like the skills-based angle, which is important because skills can be learned. You can get better at skills and mm -hmm. there's a full range of these skills that are really best when they're used together. Can you expand a little bit on the skills-based part and how it's all connected? Yeah. Well, actually, there are some really cool research that came out of Laurier University, which is right in our hometown, actually. It showed that if we think about our well-being as a skill, we are much more likely to engage in programs when they come our way that are designed to build that skill. So for example, if you think your well-being is a set of skills that you can develop, somebody offers you a mindfulness activity or workshop, the research shows that you're much more likely to actually engage in that activity if you can think mm. about it as a skill. So we very intentionally built the umbrella as a set of skills in order to help students understand that with practice and over time, these things can be built like a skill. Mm -hmm. But if you never practice them, you're probably not going to be very good at them. You right. know, if you never practice empathy and suddenly you need it, that's probably not going to be a skill that you're that's easy for you. Yeah. Likewise, like cognitive flexibility and adaptability. If you never have to adapt to anything, you're unlikely to be able to just do that, right? right? You have to find opportunities in your life to keep practicing that so you get better and better at the skills you need. Yeah. Kids who go through the most adversity in some ways have the most opportunity to develop these skills, but they also mm -hmm. need more support because the more adversity you face, the harder it is to come back at it. We've all been faced with challenges in the last few years, which is why I think the space that you're in is so 
relevant and resonant. But can you talk a little more about the trauma connection and how some kids are really just going through a hard time? And, you know, in, in some ways you need to respect and deal with Mm -hmm. the moment and the crisis when it's there, but then also be thinking about how to develop these skills. How do you navigate all of that? Let's start with the idea of kids who are really struggling, who have a lot of challenges in their life. Yeah. So one of the things that I hear most from teachers who run the Umbrella Project curriculum in their classroom is that learning about coping skills, pointing them out and holding them at a very high level of value in your classroom allows those students who are struggling more to feel valuable mm. and like they have something that they're really going to need in the future that will help them succeed that isn't their math mark. Because ultimately what happens with kids who are in really difficult situations is they're not thriving academically, right? Right. But they might be the most resilient kid in that class because, you know, somebody else might have a mom who gets up and makes them lunch and drives them to school and gives them a kiss and a hug and helps them with their homework. And some of those other kids don't have any of that. They do yeah. a lot of these things for themselves, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so first and foremost, just being able to see that invisible layer of coping skills is good for everybody, right? There's no downside to knowing that you have this superpower and this mm -hmm. strength in your coping skills, even if at that moment, like your actual outcomes aren't. A reframing of what can be a stigma as a yeah, strength. Well, exactly. Yeah. So I think that piece is really important. And then we very intentionally built this as a proactive, you can build these skills in advance, but very, very much thought about trauma when we were building the program too, because mm -hmm. certainly when things are calm and you've got some extra capacity, sure, you can, you know, practice yeah. these skills and take on challenges and, you know, apply gross mindset to your math work. And, but also what I've seen from the research around post-traumatic growth and, mm -hmm. you know, Unfortunately, a lot of these traumas that kids experience in a classroom setting really can't control. But post-traumatic growth happens in the conditions of somebody being able to understand the growth narrative, yeah. have a broader sense of purpose, build gratitude for their life, and really know that in those most difficult moments, something could be taken from that. So. Mm -hmm. Having more of the umbrella skills, even in the face of trauma, can allow, can set the conditions for a student to experience more growth mm -hmm. from those difficult times. The research between post-traumatic growth and resilience is really interesting. A lot of people equate these two things as the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Resilience and post-traumatic growth. But actually, they found there's a negative correlation between the two. So resilience is more like... As you go through your life and things happen, your ability to get back to neutral, yeah. your ability to recenter. It's almost like a floor effect, right? Like you want to be able to maintain no less than a certain level of... Yeah, like back you to know. your equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So when I think about building resilience, what I actually think about is shortening the duration of time it takes you to get back to center. Yeah. As opposed to this like linear growth mm -hmm. model. Mm-hmm. What they found with post-traumatic growth is that there has to be trauma. And often people who are less resilient will experience more trauma mm. from an experience. So if you're really strong at resilience, mm. you're less and less likely to experience that trauma in the first place. Interesting. But when you do, and if you have less resilience and you have that trauma, you have the opportunity to really grow beyond what existed before for you. Mm. Mm. spiritually, emotionally, right? So there's like yeah. a kind of sort of like a tall linear growth model and then a duration wow. to neutral growth yeah. model. So these are two sort of different constructs. And so I think both are super valuable, but they require a bit of a different toolbox, which yeah. all are sort of part of that, uh, the umbrella skills, right? Yeah. They all mesh together to form and teach students a bunch of the different pieces they need in order to have any of these things, you know, yeah. have resilience or have post-traumatic growth, but they're, yeah. they're different. That's great. No, that no, that too that, science no, that was fantastic. And by the way, you're also known as <laughs> Dr. Jen. If for those of you who are listening, <laughs> that was Dr. Jen giving us some special insight. I very much appreciate that. And it also relates to what's in it for me a bit in that understanding this stuff is also helpful in terms of 
kind of the strengths based. How do I think about myself as an employee, as a human? How do I mm. achieve my fullest potential? There's like a positive psychology element to it. And also in your book, The Umbrella Effect, there's like surveys and quizzes so that I can mm -hmm. learn more about myself, you know, and I'm also a parent. So I feel like that is another dimension to the work that you're doing. It's, it's school facing, but it's also for parents and for all of us to kind of understand ourselves and also understand our children or our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The starting point always is just understanding what does everything look like today? Where are we at? Where am I at? Where are my kids at? What do we need? What do we have? Taking kind of like a, just a snapshot of like, yeah, a where, where a diagnostic. are we? A diagnostic snapshot of like, where are we? Yeah. And I think if you don't do that, life just presents you a series of obstacles and you tend to use the skills, you build certain skills in abundance and others get kind of just pushed off to the wayside. And the stronger you get in your strong skills, the stronger they get. Yeah. But you tend to use less and less the weaker skills, right? Because they're just not serving you. We right, do what right. works, right? Mm -hmm. So you can just leave it to life to do that. But if you know, if you take a survey of all your, the grownups, you know, you'll probably note that like the empathetic just get more and more and more. They like go right. into that skill so much that eventually that skill starts to become like one of their weaknesses as opposed right. to, or like the grit, the gritty get grittier, the Right. right. Everybody right. kind of has their thing that works for them that they do a lot of. So mm -hmm. I love the idea of strengths. We always recommend after you do this umbrella assessment that you notice, like, what are my strengths and how did I get those? Mm -hmm. Take a moment to just go slow to go fast. Right. Reflect like, wow, I've been through a lot and I've developed some really great skills. Same mm -hmm. with your kids. Right. Mm -hmm. Noticing, wow, you're really good at that and pointing it out to them. You're you know, you're a very kind person. I like how you do that. That's a really important skill. Yeah. But I think the piece that we often miss when we just look at strengths is this other side of like, what aren't I developing? Mm -hmm. For me growing up, it was autonomy. I was very much a child who was under some great umbrellas of my parents' protection. Yeah. It didn't really force me to go out and choose my own direction and execute it. Mm -hmm. I still, to this day as a 45-year-old, still feel like that's hard for me to sit down plan out a full and execute on my own project the, to my own direction. I'm often, do you think I should, do you think I should do this? Do you think right. that's a good idea? Right. And how might I do that? Right? <laughs> like <laughs> that, that piece for me is, is weaker. Yeah. And if you can notice that early in your children, what is the part of them that is really going to hold them back? In life, you can start to put some very patient and concerted effort towards building the skills that your child's missing. Yeah. And in this, we can like really, really diminish how much parenting effort we're actually putting out because we're mm. getting specific, right? Each kid doesn't need the same thing. Right. One of my kids desperately needs self-compassion. That is her weakest skill. And it really gets in the way of her enjoying her life. Mm. One of my other, I have two teenagers and a toddler. So my other teenager, empathy is a big thing for him. Like that's just always been the thing that we're always chipping away at, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. and helping him understand that they don't need the same Thing, if I put more empathy into my daughter, it's going to kill her. Like she <laughs> does not need any more empathy. She's maxed out on that skill. She's really good, too mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, totally. As a parent, I feel tired as a parent in the world that we're in right now because there's so much information yeah. about what we could and should be doing for our kids. But actually, what we could and should be doing for our kids is noticing who they are and being very specific about what they need. Right. Yeah. And then tailoring our parenting to noticing their strengths and building on the skills that they're missing. Yeah. We haven't gotten to the listicle phase of the conversation where we go through the skills, but th we do need language to talk about this stuff. And in a lot of ways, that is really the foundational piece for a parent or for an educator is let's name it and let's tie it to actual research that is demonstrating that these are the attributes and components that have been found to lead to happier and, and more successful lives in a way that maybe takes mm -hmm. it easy on us, but get, gets through as many of these as possible. I'd love to hear some of the words that you use to describe the competencies and the skills that comprise the umbrella. An easy way to think about this when we've done research on our curriculum, the outcomes of having all of these skills that we have found are just a, a general increase in emotional intelligence, but an increase in adaptability 
an increase in interpersonal skills, and an increase in stress management. Mm. So when we look at all the skills, what they kind of do for us, they help us have better relationships. They help us adapt when the world changes around us, and they help us manage stress. Mm. So most of the skills you've probably heard of, and you can easily go to our website, umbrellaproject.co, and there you can find you know, a list of all the skills, but it's things like cognitive flexibility. Didn't we see how that impacted us when COVID hit? Right. And now we need to change our jobs, our parenting school routine. We need to be learning from computer. Like yeah. cognitive flexibility became the skill that if right. you didn't have it, it was really going to be a hard, hard time for you. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's skills like that. There's skills like a sense of purpose integrity, a growth mindset, yeah. um, mm -hmm. their skills like empathy and kindness. And they all play their role. I mean, I, we talk about cognitive flexibility as like an adaptability to change. But have you ever been in a personal relationship with somebody who doesn't have cognitive flexibility? Mm. It's not easy, yeah. right? Cognitive flexibility allows us to adapt to being with somebody else and their routines in there, yeah. right? If you don't, if you can't flex a little bit. Yeah. When you integrate somebody else into your life, mm -hmm. especially that's a tough one. especially over years, you know, like the, the idea that you yeah. can't, flexibility is again, it's just sort of a table stakes for survival in yeah in, in this day and age. But yeah, and that's why the skills exactly. are really they're they're relevant. You can get a workup of yourself and your kid, right? That's that's what's mm -hmm. built into the umbrella effect, the book, which will include a link. To that. And then if you're an educator or you're in a school-based system, there are programs that help integrate this into the curriculum. That's the other component that I'd, mm -hmm. I'd love to get a little more your perspective on. You know, this it, social emotional learning, a lot of the other interventions that are coming online now can fail because they're not really integrated. They're treated as something kind of extra separate mm -hmm. that thing that mm -hmm. I do over here and it doesn't necessarily relate to the rest of yeah. their school day. Can you talk a little bit about how this program connects and relates to the rest of what happens in school? Totally. You know, before I started the curriculum, because I was seeing patients in practice, I wasn't a curriculum developer and I, there were a lot of things that I had to learn along the way. I spent a couple months just really talking to educators and teachers about what was happening and what they wanted, and what the problem was. And I did it until I could predict what the answer was going to be. That was a, a really great advice that I got. You know when you're done interviewing people, when you know what they're going to say before they say it. So right, right. I, I researched as much as I could what teachers needed in order to help the situation that we all find ourselves in now with youth mental health. And the things that I heard really frequently were, we don't want any extra work. We can't add anything to our plate. We do not have time. Yeah. We do not want it to be a program that comes and goes. It can't be a one-off. And, you know, these small eight-week programs with no follow-up yeah. aren't going to help us because they have this great big bang effect. And then it just, that's the end, right? We don't practice it. It's not going to help us. Mm -hmm. So when we thought about how to integrate this into schools, we really realized that coping skills are everywhere. Kids are using these all the time. It's not like they're not present. It's just that we don't talk about them. We don't see them and yep. we don't integrate them. Mm -hmm. So examples of the coping skills are in English class. They're in religion. They're in history. They're in geography. They're everywhere. They're on the playground. So the curriculum itself is designed to first, number one, teach kids this metaphor. How are all these pieces fitting together? What is the story that you can have for the rest of your life to understand very simply what's happening and how all the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm. Then one by one, we break down each skill and we just teach kids like, what is it? You know, do you know what self-compassion is? Can yeah. you define it? Can you see it? And then we teach teachers and students alike to go out into the world and find this skill. So we have lots of story examples. We know stories have always, since the dawn of human time, been a powerful way to transmit information and to tie the emotional brain to the intellectual brain. So to, yeah. to really make things stick, right? Mm -hmm. So we have examples of lots of stories of real people and storybooks and all the different things that that skill is the focus. So kids mm -hmm. can understand, okay, self-compassion, that means when things go wrong, 
I choose to be nice to myself. I, you know, give myself comfort instead of mm -hmm. telling myself I'm an idiot. Yeah. And then out we go into the playground, into the world, into the curriculum, into yeah. everything that we're doing. And that month, our goal is to bring that skill back as much as possible, to notice it wherever it is, to notice it when we're using it. Some schools will, you know, recognize different students in different ways who are really using that skill or working on it. And then there's lots of other pieces to more tangibly teach the skill, but at the very core of how I think SEL blends without a lot of extra work for a teacher and how teachers can learn alongside students is this very compassionate way of just seeing the skill, understanding why does it matter if I have a growth mindset? It's great if we have a poster on the wall that says, you know, I should think about failure as, as learning. However, right. show me. Show me what that looks like. Show me how that's helped somebody. Show me it in me, yeah. right? Show me it in my peers. Let's celebrate these skills. And then each month or each two, well, however the school decides the cadence of the curriculum, mm -hmm. we add another piece, right? And then after two years of skills, we repeat the same skills, but it's a different teacher and it's yeah. a different class and it's a different way of a deepening. And so over time, mm -hmm. and over the course of the student's education, when they get to learn about these skills, quite a few times in different ways from different people. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. And at the same time, it makes me think about the umbrella skills of the teachers themselves and what they're coping with. And, and then also for parents, it reminds me almost of the, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first before you, <laughs> you focus on your child. There, there is an element of we're all going through some stuff nowadays and, you know, providing a framework that applies to everyone. And especially thinking about what it's like as a teacher, can you expand on that a little bit? The importance of teachers thinking about their own well-being and their own self-care and their own umbrella yeah. skills, even as they're conveying that. Because in some ways, ideally, you're modeling a lot of these skills as the adult in the room. Absolutely. One of my favorite, favorite things to get parents to do when they come into my office with a child who's struggling with coping is to think about the thing that they really weren't good at in high school or grade school. What is the thing? You weren't a math person. You didn't like sports. You couldn't play music that you really self-identified as not being good at. And then I ask them, you know, if they're really committed to this, go out and try to learn that thing again. Mm. Remember what it feels like to learn something really hard. Because the more as a parent, we can show our kids what it looks like to suck at something, to take yeah. on a hard challenge, to work through it. The more we can first empathize with what we ask our kids to do every day, which is go to school, do every subject. We want them to do well in all of them and we want them to make good friends with that. You know, like what we ask kids to do is a mm. really difficult task. Right. Right. So even just the empathy for the journey. I, I mean, I personally went out and tried to learn how to play volleyball because I was not a I was a dancer growing up, not a sports kid. Yeah. And I was like totally flaked out in gym class. And oh, my gosh, like. There was a moment when I was standing on the volleyball court, like almost in tears because I remembered it all came flooding back to me like, oh, yes, this is why I flaked out in in high school in sport because this sucks. Like this does not feel good. It doesn't feel good to be the worst at this. Yeah. I don't want to, It's so much energy just to try to. Right. So I think first and foremost, when it comes to teachers and parents, like your umbrella matters, too. When I think about kind of the education system right now, yeah. I really envision a lot of teachers whose umbrellas are like just worn down, you know, one side, right? And with just so many people crowded under that umbrella, yeah. so many kids who also don't have their own skills, like it mm. feels like a system that is unsustainable yeah. eventually, right? And what yeah. I want to think about and how I think about community with in terms of the umbrella metaphor is that the best example that I can think of as strong community is that everybody has their own umbrella and everybody gets to take a turn being the person who needs extra help from those strong umbrellas. Like we're all going to face times that are not, that are way too much for one umbrella to handle, right? Yeah, but yeah. at the end of that, and when you've kind of come through that, you should be able to open back up your umbrella and contribute again to the community in this sort of strong and um, in, in an exchange kind of way where it's okay to be the one helping and it's okay to be the one that needs help. Mm -hmm. And right now it just feels like, some very tired helpers and a lot of people who need help, yeah. right? 
And so that's why why there's an a parenting book and a curriculum. And mm -hmm. we train doctors to do this. And because I feel like in order to make a real difference in our society's well-being, we need to all be on board with this idea, this idea yeah. that we all need to build these skills that are much more important than just an academic mark or, you know, whether our standardized testing is up to snuff, right? Right, right? I think often when the standardized testing comes back poor, it's because we don't have these umbrella skills. None of us do, right? We're a tired system. Right. I think if you did no standardized testing at all and just focused on these skills, you'd probably see those marks go up. Right. Because kids would be able to cope with the learning journey. Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny, you know, maybe just because it's been raining here for the last couple of days, but you never find a lost umbrella on a rainy day. Like all the umbrellas <laughs> are, are accounted for when the rain is coming down and it mm -hmm. has been raining for the last few years in, in some sense. But uh, but then at the same time, a lot of what you're describing makes sense to me. It sounds great, but there has been a bit of a pushback against SEL from some folks. These I guess there's pushback against everything nowadays based on where we are as a society, but there has been some blowback against SEL programs. And I'd, I'd like to get a little bit of your perspective on that, because this is something you've been leaning into mm -hmm. for quite some time. So I imagine you can understand when it's a pendulum swinging back and forth versus what else might be going on here. What What are your thoughts? I, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts on this. I think one of the big, big problems and why there's a lot of pushback on SEL is when we start to silo coping skills. So I'll use the example of grit getting a lot of pushback because of the fact that not every problem is a grittable problem. Mm. I mean, it's a bit of a luxury to have the perseverance and passion towards a long-term goal that takes energy in the system. Yeah. And that takes certain conditions that some people are not fortunate enough to have. So I, the pushback against grit is very legitimate. But grit is one piece of a lot of pieces in, of an umbrella. Grit is not always the right coping skill to right. use. Sometimes there are other skills that we need to think about and use. So not to throw, you know, the baby out with the bathwater, but just to what I've really tried to accomplish in my world, in my practice and in the Umbrella Project, is a more holistic view of coping skills. Mm -hmm. Another example, empathy. There are some programs that teach empathy and then kids go home into a house where empathy is not valued and it's in fact seen as a weakness. And when they try to use that skill, they learn pretty quickly there's a, a conflict between home and school and what mm -hmm. I'm learning there. And that's hard too, right? Maybe empathy is not the skill that they're going to take home, but doesn't mean they shouldn't be learning it mm -hmm. in the context that it, it's best used, mm -hmm. right? We need to be critical thinkers in how we're using coping skills too. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that's, that's one piece of it. Another piece that I've heard a lot of controversy, and it comes up a lot because I'm a naturopathic doctor, so we talk a lot about nutrition and healthy food and, you know, what our bodies need to thrive. And so I have heard a lot of controversy around teaching nutrition mm -hmm. now because not everybody has equitable access to healthy food. And there might be some really difficult moments for people who do not have equitable access to healthy food to mm -hmm. learn that this is what optimal looks like. Sorry you know, you can't be optimal because of the factors in your life. Right. And, you know, that's a really tough question because if you never plant the seeds of what those fundamentally important things are, you'll never have that information to take with you into your adult life. So when I was first practicing, I had the opportunity to work with an organization here in town called KidsLink. And they had a residential program. It was, you know, families that were struggling the most in the region with mental health. And they hired me specifically to come into their programs and teach some of these basic fundamental principles of what our brains need most to thrive mm -hmm. as a way to plant a seed for those students to know that they're worthy of that information, that even if they can't execute on it right now, that we believe them to be worth enough to give them the information and, you know, so that they can take it into their lives. So very different philosophy on teaching some of those principles. And I yeah. think, you know, having a, a discussion about it is so important because really our brains do not thrive on junk food. Right. And right, that that is not a 
um, like that's a pretty scientific based fact. We need yeah. healthy food. And some of the reasons some of these kids aren't thriving is because they don't have access to that. Yeah. That to me brings in the idea of culturally sensitive delivery of the curriculum where understanding mm-hmm. that there are other perspectives, which ties also to empathy, like just understanding yeah. that there might be others out there who have these challenges. How do you still deliver the scientifically correct information about nutrition and health, but do so yeah. in a way that's sensitive to the fact that for some kids, receiving that information, processing it and integrating it with their home life is going to come with more challenge. Yeah. And so, I mean, the way we do it in the Umbrella Project curriculum specifically is we have one unit that is about what happens under your umbrella and mm-hmm. all the things that your brain needs in order to function at its best. Yeah. So we put everything together in a way like sleep and screen time and outdoor time and laughter yeah. and food. And we talk about what all these different things are. And then we have students, you know, learn how to pick one thing that they can chip away at, one thing that's within their control. So it doesn't have to be that you change your diet and your yeah. sleep and your exercise and your screen time and your laughter and your, you know, maybe what you can control is, you know, your bedtime. Maybe what you can control is, you know, encouraging your parents to pick up one vegetable when they go to the store for you. Maybe what you can control. And so we try to present enough options that these are all valuable for your brain. Is there one thing that you want to work on? Yeah. And in that way, it's like teaching somebody how to make a change if they want to make a change. Yeah. You know, as opposed to saying that you have to change all these things. Yeah, absolutely. I understand why you're called Dr. Jen, because there's a lot of really (laughs) useful information that I certainly picked up in this conversation. Hopefully our listeners enjoyed what you heard. It's umbrellaproject.co is the website to check Mm -hmm. out. As we're reaching our conclusion here, Jen, what takeaways might folks get from our conversation? If you have some concluding thoughts, what do you want to share with our audience? Oh, gosh, there's so many things. One thing that I really would love for everybody to know is that we are stronger together. There was a time, I think, when it was easy to think about the world like you versus me. If my child is the best person on the team, that's what I'm going for, right? Like me and mine versus you and yours. Yeah. And I think we'd be really well served right now to slow down a little bit and think about us versus the problem. And kids are so connected these days via their technology. The, in, the level of information that they receive from the world really does put them in a me versus everyone else. Mm. You know, do I have, am I the prettiest? Am I the smartest? Am I the, you right? Yeah. And it's like, it's like that. If we could just all start from the same starting point, which is why, you know, I think the curriculum and the book and all the pieces If we could get on the same side, us versus the problem and understand that our kids are so deeply connected that when one is struggling, it spreads through the group. So your parenting effort is well served if you are also helping your child's friend and your child's friend's friend thrive in this system, have good coping skills that they can support each other with. So that's what I think is a good takeaway. Like not it's not just for you, it's for you and the people around you. So, Mm. you know, you and your school and or like your group of friends that you your kids hang out, right? Everybody starts to get on the same page about struggle being really a normal part of life and teaching coping skills and celebrating them. Then I think we're going to get a lot further. Awesome. Fantastic stuff from Dr. Jennifer Forrestal, Dr. Jen the author of The Umbrella Effect, and the program is The Umbrella Project, umbrellaproject.co. Jen, thanks so much for joining us on today's show. Mike, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk about these important things, and I appreciate the opportunity with you. Fantastic. Hopefully our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. If you did, please write us a review, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. Trending in Education.